now. Could we close up the doors for a living? In case the noise is bothering you. Oh, sorry. Could we close those? Hi, folks. We're oh, just yeah. giving everyone a few seconds to get logged in before we get started here. Um, if you are already in here, I'm pasting some info in chat about how you can buy Rosalie's book from the bookstore and how you can get 15% off when you buy from Greenlight within the next week. So check that out in the chat. All right, good evening. And welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. We're excited to host tonight's event with Rosalie Connect, presenting her new book, Vera Kelly is Not a Mystery. She'll be talking with Sarah Grand, so you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just want to say a huge thanks to everyone for making this happen and to all of you for showing up. Green light storefronts are currently closed, but our community is still here. And we're grateful for your support and for the chance to make this space for conversation and connection. Now I have just a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, first, you can see and hear the speakers, but they cannot see or hear you. Your, your video and audio are not turned on. Um, they will see your name over in our attendee list and they can see your name when you comment and chat or ask questions in the Q&A. If you scroll over the bottom of your Zoom window, you'll see a couple of functions that we'll be using throughout the event. One of them is labeled chat. Um, you can comment in there anytime throughout the event if you want to say something about um, what's being discussed in the conversation. If you want to say hello to the authors, provide some virtual applause after the reading or during high points in conversation and connect with your fellow attendees. Um, at the bottom of your Zoom window, you'll also see another icon labeled Q&A. Wow. This is where we'll be pulling questions from uh, at the audience Q&A portion towards the end of our event. You can type your questions in there at any point throughout tonight's conversation. And if you see someone else's question that you would really like to hear answered, you can upvote it. And the questions with the most likes will float towards the top of our queue so that those are the first ones we see when we're pulling questions to ask Rosalie. We are recording tonight's event, so look for video or audio versions on our website and social channels later on. And tonight feature, tonight's featured book, Vera Kelly is Not a Mystery, is available for sale from greenlightbookstore.com. Though our stores are closed, we're working with our supplier warehouse for fast direct-to-home shipping. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. And we're offering 15% off on the featured book when you purchase it from Greenlight's website in the next week. You can find that coupon code in the chat. Our interviewer for this evening is Sarah Gran. She's a novelist and screenwriter who lives in California. Her most recent book is The Infinite Blacktop. She'll be speaking with our featured author, Rosalie Connect. She is the author of Who is Vera Kelly and Relief Map. She's the translator of Cesar Ira's The Seamstress in the Wind and a Center for Fiction Emerging Writer Fellow. In her new book, Vera Kelly is Not a Mystery, the Vera Kelly series returns in full force as our recently out of the spy game heroine finds herself traveling from Brooklyn to a sprawling countryside estate in the Caribbean in her first case as a private investigator. Rosalie is gonna start us off with a reading from the book and then she'll be talking with Sarah and with all of you. Rosalie, please take it away. Thank you. Um, thank you to everyone for coming. I really wish that I could see all of you. Uh, I'm having kind of this nostalgia for like the last time I was doing this and we were um, in the Greenlight uh, bookstore on uh, Flatbush and it had that kind of sweaty summer, you know, a bunch of people crammed into a small space feel and I really miss that and I wish I could, I wish I could see all of you. I wish 
so we had been milling around before this and catching up and talking to each other. I really love all that. And I hope, you know, for the next one, I hope I get to do that in person um, with all of you. But on the plus side, I, I got to invite some people who normally would never have been able to make it because they live too far away. So I'm really happy to see all of you. Um, so yeah, this is so my book, which um, my husband Mark has posed on the bookshelf uh, expertly, I will say, behind me. Um, uh, it just came out last week. Um, so, you know, when I wrote the first Vera Kelly book, I did not intend to make it a series. That was something that kind of happened organically, and I'm kind of shocked at how much I've enjoyed <laughs> writing another, uh, a second one in the series, um, and kind of playing around with this uh, genre and these tropes and kind of how kind of liberating that has felt um, and how much it's meant to me. Um, so I'm going to uh, start at the beginning. I'm just going to read the first few pages of this book, um, as I think she described. Um, but when I'm nervous, I don't retain anything in my short term memory. So I can't remember <laughs> exactly what she said. But um, she, <laughs> so at the end of the first book, she has, um, you know, she was recruited by the CIA, but she kind of left disenchanted at the end of the first book, disenchanted with the CIA sort of project. Um, and at the beginning of the second book, she's just gotten dumped and fired on the same day. That's what we're going to see. Um, and so this is the, the, the blow that kind of sets her off on this path towards going into business for herself as a, as a private investigator. Um, so kind of that noir turn from, from spy um, to, to private eye. August 1967, Brooklyn, New York. Chapter one. The morning after Jane left me, I woke in a Russian diner that overlooked the boardwalk at Brighton Beach, sitting upright in the corner of a booth. I had always been grateful for an all-night restaurant. A waitress with red cheeks was refilling the cup of coffee in front of me and rotating the plate with its scraps of corned beef, clearing her throat politely. I sat up and thanked her. Through the fogged glass, I could see the gray ocean, pale and soft, meeting a paler sky. Down the beach, the wonder wheel at Coney Island was coming out of the pre-dawn dark. I put my hand over the mug and the waitress moved away. By my watch, it was 6.40 in the morning, which meant that it was almost 24 hours now since things had begun to go wrong. Jane had said, I'm tired of waiting for you to want me here. She was standing in the hallway between my bedroom and the second floor bathroom, holding the powder pink bag with her makeup and toothbrush in it, wearing my dressing gown. I don't have to move in, but you hardly talk to me. I talk to you, I said. About what, she said. About nothing. I turn around and you've left the room. I talk to you, I said. You say clever things, and when I try to answer you seriously, you make clever jokes. You can move in then, I said, becoming desperate. You can move in. I've been stupid. You know I can't. You would make me miserable. She waved her hand toward the hall, the stairs. You practically faint when I leave my shoes on the rug. She brushed past me to my room. I leaned in the doorway and watched her getting dressed. My eyes were stinging, my nose was stinging. I sneezed. I have a class to teach, she said. I'll get the rest of my things later. Don't go, I said. I set it into my cupped hand. She patted my shoulder. You're a nice girl, Vera, she said, but you're impossible. Jane was noisy and hot with a bright face. After she left, the house felt like a meat locker despite the August weather. I went for a long, blurry walk. When I got home, I stood in the kitchen for 15 minutes looking at the wall clock and then had a whiskey and sat in the garden. The roses were blooming for the second time that year. They were yellow washed with pink like sherbet melting in a bowl of punch. The starling who lived under the eaves of the shed came out to scream at me. He thought the yard was his. It was 10 o'clock in the morning. It was time to go to work. I was one of the film editors for the news broadcast at the WKNY station near the battery. I started leaking tears on the Q train over the river because the view was too big and I could see the trees on Governor's Island fizzing and dark in the sun. The summer would be over soon. I made it to my break before I called her. She had a telephone in her office at Brooklyn College and she would have just finished her afternoon romantic poetry class. It rang twice and she picked up. Jane, I said, I think this is a mistake. I'll make it up to you. Vera, it's too late, all right, I'm sorry. What do you mean, I said. I was alone in the editing room and I was keeping my voice low. George Kepler must have been listening in from the switchboard or patched in from another office. 
Later, I wondered if he had been listening to my calls for months, ever since he had cornered me at the bar where the editors and runners went after the evening broadcast, and I had pushed him off, laughing. What do you mean it's too late, I said. Is there someone else? She said nothing. Christ, Jane, is there? There is? I didn't plan it this way, she said. I hung up and tried not to fall apart. My eyes were rattling in my head. I went to the stairwell and smoked a cigarette and then another. I returned to the editing room. My supervisor, Mr. Anderson, was there, standing with George Kepler, who looked very pleased. Vera, I need to speak with you, Mr. Anderson said, and turned to indicate his office with a sweep of his hand, as if we were going to the theater together. What for, I said. George Kepler turned and walked away. The hairs on the back of my neck were standing up. Privately, he said. He shut the door behind us and pointed to a chair. His windows looked out on a post office lot with a huge doorway to an underground garage where fleets of mail trucks came and went in the bloom. Sunlight never touched the street in this part of town. There's a character clause in your employment contract, he said. He looked at me as if I should grasp his meaning, and then I did. A mask descended. I tried to keep my voice calm. Can you make yourself clear, I said. I have a lot of work to do. No, you don't, he said. You're in violation of your employment contract. We can't keep people on staff who live that way. He pushed back from his desk and began searching in his coat pocket for his matches. His color was rising and he wouldn't look at me. I told them you would be a problem, he said, when they first promoted you from the floor. It was obvious to anyone with eyes. They didn't listen to me. He found the matches. We'll mail you your paycheck. You'll take his word, I said. George Kepler is the worst editor you have. He takes twice as long as the rest of us. You're wasting my time, he said. There were two more editors at their desks when I came back to get my things. George was standing at the side of the room watching one of the monitors, but he looked over and I stared until he turned away. I packed everything into my purse and a shopping bag I found in the lounge. I had never kept much at my desk anyway. There was a tense silence while I sifted through my papers. The youngest editor, a sweet boy named Carl, was concerned. Going somewhere, he said. Nice to know you, Carl, I said. It had been. He looked surprised. And then I was back out on the street again. The awful thing was that it was a beautiful day, one of those slow, rich August afternoons when the light hit the battery like the inside of a cathedral. I walked slowly, having nowhere I wanted to be, now or for the foreseeable future. A man at a hot dog cart was having an argument with a seagull, which was hopping away with half a pretzel. Two children were racing each other to the railing overlooking the water, and the leaves in a stand of little birches were all alight and shivering. I had a pain in my chest as if I had swallowed too much air. I walked as far as the Staten Island Ferry Terminal and sat on a bench for a long time, doing nothing at all and not seeing much until it occurred to me that I could smoke. I smoked three or four cigarettes. The six o'clock ferry was leaving and I got on and went to Staten Island and back just to feel the sea wind in my hair. I stood at the railing with a crowd of happy visitors taking pictures of the Statue of Liberty and tried to think what to do with myself. Okay, I'll stop there. Great. It's so disconcerting to do these readings and not have the audience there. It's like you stop and it's this great silence. So great. Hey, thank you, Sarah. <laughs> you know, everyone here is clapping symbolically and in their homes, we're all clapping. Everybody clapping. I'll just assume the crowd is going wild. Going They've wild. got noise makers, throwing their hats in here. Yeah. They're throwing their chairs around. Julie Swayze, <laughs> who's my friend from Instagram, says clap. We're clapping. Excellent. Thank you, Julie. <laughs> Um, so that was beautiful. Thank you so much. And I have to say as a native New Yorker, I love that um, you included the very important fact about New York that people take the Staten Island Ferry for with no intention of going to Staten Island at all. <laughs> but it's the key thing of, of being a New Yorker is, you know, someone said just flipped a table. Thank you, Nancy Lambert. You just <laughs> for Rosalie, which she deserves for that great reading. Um, it's great that you included the, yes, this important fact that the best reason to take the Staten Island Ferry is just to take it and come back. Um, Absolutely. So why don't we start by you telling everyone a little bit more about Vera Kelly, about where she's been and where she's going and who she is and what time period of existence this is in and, and just tell us a little bit more about the series so everyone knows what we're up to here. Sure. So I, you know, my interest uh, going into this whole project was that I, um, I was curious about spy novels and I think I, I put myself the sort of task of writing a spy novel because I wanted to force myself to learn how to write plot. Um, 
And so when thinking about spy novels, what I was interested in was kind of the mid-century Cold War spy novel. Like I, I liked sort of the conventions of that. And I feel like we all kind of have a feeling for that. It's sort of in the air, like you just kind of absorb it. It's James Bond, right? It's kind of all of those associated things. Yeah, it's a part um, of your culture, yeah. Totally, it's very, it's very accessible to everyone. You kind of know these tropes, like just you feel them. Um, so yeah, so I wrote the first book and I was kind of combining like some little bits of family history with um, just a lot of kind of invented material about, about that era. And I'd read some, some books about the CIA in the 60s and um, you know, all those kinds of things and about what was happening in Argentina at that time. Um, and I had spent some time in Argentina myself, which is why I was interested. And uh, so I wrote this first book in which she, um, she's a young woman, she grows up in Chevy Chase, Maryland, um, which is a, an affluent suburb outside of DC. Um, she's growing up, you know, she's a teenager in the 50s. Um, she's kind of realizing she's gay or is sort of touching on and afraid of the fact that maybe she's gay. Yeah. She doesn't really have a vocabulary for that as a, as a younger kid. Um, and she has a contentious relationship with her mom. Her dad is dead. So there's not a whole lot holding her in place. And as soon as she has a chance to, she kind of runs off to New York and sort of tries to live this independent life, um, which is precarious for a woman on her own at that time. Um, it's just hard to get a job that will really pay enough yeah. to, to support a person in 1962 or 61 or to support a woman. Um, so she gets, she's approached, she starts working at a radio station and she kind of learns some technical stuff and she's approached by a recruiter for the CIA. So that's how she starts working for the CIA. So, can you hear that? The windows are open. Dance um, party. Dance party. <laughs> Everybody flip your table, dance party. <laughs> <laughs> There's some like incredible sound system going up and down the avenue in front of our apartment. Um, Technological miracle. So her big, you know, her big, uh, the, the center of that book is this uh, operation that she, she goes on to Argentina and, and there's a coup happening there and, and all of that. And I, I won't spoil it. Um, but at the end of it, she's back in New York and she's quit the CIA. So in this book, she's um, sort of starting out again and trying to figure out, she's sort of, in a sense, in, in the position again of trying to figure out how to make it functionally on her own without kind of the, the cushions that were supposed to be available to a woman at that time, which is basically that you're supposed to be married, you're supposed to be part of a family yeah. unit. Um, and that's, that's, that's Barry Kelly. That's where she starts out. <laughs> very cool, very cool. Um, so you said you didn't plan for it to be a series. So I was interested to hear that because we were talking a little bit earlier today about genre and what makes a piece sort of in the genre or not. So it seems like the first book your plan was to do a really different genre, which is CIA, spy novels. And then now you've sort of transitioned into the detective world, into the PI world, which is they're like cousins. <laughs> and they're like not exactly the same thing, but very related things. Um, did you make a decision to go into the private eye genre or did it just seem natural for the character to go that way or? It sort of felt, it felt natural for the character because kind of her arc in the first book was to become, you know, the, the, the mission that she is sent on is, you know, sort of like farcically falls apart. Um, and so like part of that process is like her understanding like, what am I, what am I doing here? You know, like what is, the, the United States interest in this like third party country? Like how does any of this make sense? Like why are, why are we doing this proxy thing? For who, for what? Like what is actually being accomplished? Um, so she kind of has to be doing something that's not the CAA by the time we return to her um, in the second book. So in that sense, it did make sense. And I kind of liked how it connects to this like kind of tension in noir. I mean, to me, they're both under the heading of noir. Um, mm -hmm. And there's that tension between like there's this attraction towards, there's this sort of, um, there's this attraction towards like the sort of government arm of law and order, but also a rejection of it. And that's why the, the private eye is so often the protagonist. It's like, you can kind of have both. Like these are um, people who behave in sort of the stylized way. Um, yeah. They're like set up in opposition to wrongdoing, but without having to be the police because the police are also um, you know, like often yeah. are among the wrong doers. Genre, of, yeah, <laughs> in this genre of, of books, like uh, so, it's a slightly rambly way. But yes, I, I, um, it kind of was a necessity of the plot that she would make that turn. But I, I enjoyed it, um, kind of exploring both sides of that. 
Well, that actually brings us to a question I was going to ask later, but I will move it up and ask now because you just hit on it is I think like the genre in general, but these books in particular, she does intersect with authority and with state authority in particular in a really interesting way. Um, that she is in the CIA and then leaves the CIA and then she has this history of being in these uh, group homes that her mother kicked her out. She was in this home and then she ends up working in one. And I just, you know, I just wanted to talk more about what you just said that this intersection of the PI with these larger sort of state apparatuses and how it works for her in particular. Um, and she's sort of going against the, the wishes of the US government, I think in both books really, isn't she? Yeah, um, I mean, in the first one, she, she sort of sets out with a very kind of Kennedy era naivety about, yeah. about what she's doing and is like sort of disabused of that, that naiveness um, until she sort of sees like there's not, not only am I not sure if I'm on board with this project, but like there is actually no way for this project to succeed. Like this doesn't, you know, none of this makes sense. Um, yeah. So at the point when she realizes that this isn't, you know, doesn't make sense, that's when she kind of exits. Um, in the second one, she's just sort of operating in a universe where it's just not possible to, you know, to really appeal directly to the government for assistance with, with the, the case that comes up. So the, the case that she's presented with, and in every private eye novel, there's a sort of like, and then trouble walked in the door, you know? Uh, <laughs> so in this sort of, the trouble that walks in the door is this, um, elderly Dominican couple who say that they're from this, um, they're from a, uh, a very wealthy family in the Dominican Republic and they're looking for um, their nephew's son uh, who's come to New York and they can't find him. Um, and so she, they can't, you know, she can't appeal to her CIA contacts or the police or anybody for assistance with this because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the United States was essentially on the side. The United States was very much propping up the Dominican government through this whole era and only a couple of years before had mounted a, a violent invasion. I mean, that's, uh, what's the word for that? It's a repetitive phrase. <laughs> there are no nonviolent invasions, but there, there had been like an yeah, no, invasion. Yeah, yeah, but there are some that are more coercive and some that are more violent, yeah. Right. Um, just a couple of years before. So that she's in this position of sort of trying to help this um, family that is trying to work around the official system because um, the official system is, is, you know, on the other side, essentially. Um, um, and I think that she's a little bit of an agent. I think that the books themselves, they, they, are, they take an interesting stand against, not against authority, but an interesting, as you said, it's almost like a middle path, you know, that they are, she's not working, or she starts off working for the government and then sort of goes a different way, but she's also not working for anyone else. She is, and that, to me, that's part of the beauty of the private eye novelist. It's this person who is not attached to any side, who does not have their own agenda. Right. Who is just looking to sort of get to the heart of the thing. Right. It's this kind of fantasy of like a lone wolf kind of morality yeah. where you could just like go out there and you don't have to serve anybody and you can just sort of decide you're going to uncover the truth and like that will accomplish what you're trying to do. <laughs> yeah. 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 It is. It is a fantasy, I think. Yeah. I mean, do you think that's where the, do you think you're going to keep going and it's going to stay a private eye series or do you think you'll go to another genre next time or? Well, so I wanted this to be a trilogy. Um, so I am actually already working on the third one. Uh, <laughs> But once I'm done with, with the Vera Kelly books, I don't think I'll um, probably do more in this, in this genre. I really enjoyed it, but um, I guess I should try something else. <laughs> you said you wanted to learn how to write plot. Why was that? Just to develop as a writer? Was there a specific goal or? Yeah, I felt like, and you know, I don't know, you may have encountered this too. It felt like, so I, I have, um, I don't have a, a BFA or an MFA, but I did, um, I did major in creative writing in undergrad. I double majored, um, but so I took a lot of workshops, you know, and I sort of like I've been in, I've been in creative writing workshops, <laughs> and I learned a lot in those workshops, and I learned, you know, had a huge influence, I'm sure, on on um, how I work and how I write, um, and but that tends to be like I, coming out of those workshops, I felt like I understood a lot about how to write, but I still was like very self conscious about like overt plot. Sure. Um, sure yeah. Yeah, I think there's this sort of, it feels like there's a, it feels unliterary. And not mm -hmm. that anyone is saying that, but that it, it's easy to sort of come away with that impression. That yeah. And that's a very new thing. That's over like the past maybe 20, 30 years. Um, 
And I think it's a problem. I think if you decide to write a book without a plot, that can be a beautiful thing. But I think a lot of writers are coming out of school and they want to have just, you know, you, even Raymond Chandler said the plot is what I'm hanging my stuff on that I like to do. You know, he didn't right. talk about plot. You've got to have some something to make it make sense or make an intentional decision to do something different, you know? So I think right. that's what a lot of people are doing. Yeah. But I interrupted you. You were, you were saying something. No. I kind of wanted to hear your thoughts on that too, actually, as, as a, a person who also has kind of enjoyed playing around with, with genre and, yeah. and plot heavy genre specifically. Yeah, yeah. No, I like plots because it's another way of telling story. And I think that's the part that a lot of people miss is that it's not just like, there's a horrible expression on TV, which I would never use, but it's apropos to this, which is schmuck bait which is like um, the story engine, the thing that keeps a show going. Like what you, the audience is tuning in for is the schmuck bait, which is like someone got murdered or it's a werewolf or whatever, but you, <laughs> the intelligent highbrow TV writer, really you're doing right. something else. But you can actually, it doesn't have to be schmuck bait. That's something that is lost, I think, to a lot of writers in the modern era. Plot can be its own story and its own metaphor and its own beauty. Um, or like I said, again, you could also be beautiful to choose to go without it. What's not good is wanting to do it and not knowing how. So, um, and you succeeded. The books both have really strong through lines and really strong plots that work. I have a, I have a great pet peeve of books where the plot just kind of doesn't work. Why, why did I pay $25 for this? I want that. Yeah. Well, it's funny because I think, um, I mean, thank you. I think it also though, like when I was, when I was writing, especially the first one, I was trying to think back to like, sort of spy novels or spy movies. Often it's movies that are more readily yeah, in my mind. Yeah. Often, and I, I don't know if other people have this experience, but like there are, are sort of action movies, very plot heavy movies that I have seen and loved. And if you ask me five minutes after it was over, like, okay, what was the actual mechanism of like, what was the big reveal? Who were the bad guys exactly? I'd be like, I don't know. Like, I think it was the guy with the ponytail, but like it, you know, but there's a feeling of like, yeah. it doesn't, my personal theory is like it actually doesn't matter as much as we think like what matters is that in each scene you understand what each character is trying to do like, within that scene. yes yes and the big question yeah go ahead sorry like i love the jason Bourne movies like i love them a lot and my phone alarm's going off cool Hang on a <laughs> we will have a musical interlude while she fixes her phone <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not going to subject anyone to that that's the alarm I set on my phone to tell me to move my car for all time. <laughs> well, now you're getting the ticket. I'm sorry. Unless you can get the husband to the, get the toddler to move the car. You mentioned the toddler. Get them, get them working. Get them out. Um, but so I love the Jason Bourne movies. Like, I love them a lot. Um, and like, if you ask me to explain to you, like, yeah. it's like <laughs> agency that is the bad one, it's the CIA, but then there's this other program. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. It doesn't matter, but like in each scene, I know who is trying to do what. I know like this guy is trying to kill that guy. <laughs> this yeah, person yeah. just a shocking secret, you know, mm -hmm. and that's all you actually need. Um, anyway. Well, I uh, think the neurology of it is really interesting. I mean, I say neurology in the big sense of like how brains work. And I think it works really differently with a book and a movie. And I mm -hmm. think it's different for different readers and viewers, but I completely agree with you about movies and like, you know, when you write for TV and film and you're talking to your studio executives and they'll be like, but what about this thing that came up on page four? And I'm always telling them that's not how neurology works. The human brain, when you're watching the thing, it's like you said, you're in the moment. But it's, if you can, but it also needs to make sense for everyone working on the project. There's all these different like right. layers of it. But I like totally agree with you. It's like within that scene, you're, and you care about the character. Like, is the character getting what they want? So that's right. where I think the plot comes in. Can you support this character? And you don't want to be distracted by it. I'm always the person in the movie theater is like, is that guy the same? I don't ever know anything. So I never know anything. Yeah. Um, so you, why a trilogy? Why three? Was there some reason or you just, it just appealed to you creatively? That is just straight up sort of, it's just the feeling of the number three. You know what I mean? It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It's a satisfying. It's like you, you take off. It's the beginning, a middle, and an end, or like you yeah. take off just the top of the arc and the bottom. Like, um, that's what it felt like to me. Two feels incomplete. I don't know what it is about the number three. Um, I know. Yeah, it's a big thing. I know, and I like four too. I do like to do things in threes and fours, and two of something. It's like, what? Why would you? You never do a list of two things. Yeah, you do. Exactly. <laughs> right. Um, right. Hmm. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about Vera Kelly. Uh, 
I have a question that I've written down, but also a question that's not written down. I really like the titles, which I think are really interesting, and I wanted to hear a little bit more about them. Um, the first one is more self-explanatory. Who is Vera Kelly? Because for those of you who haven't read it, the book alternates present day and flashbacks. So you do literally find out who is Vera Kelly as you go through the book in a really, really cool way. I thought the title reflected that in a really good way. I struggle with titles and I was very impressed by your title book, Marriage Here. And the second one, it was really good too, but it's also a little less obvious. So I was curious about Vera Kelly is not a mystery. Why is she not a mystery? To me, she's still a little bit of a mystery, I have to say. In a good you know, way. I, I love this question because my answer is like partly really frustrating. <laughs> Which okay, I did not title these books basically. However, oh, okay. I was involved in the conversation, and this yeah. is how the conversation. Oh, that's how go. I do it too. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you've had this experience, but I, I think I apparently I do not naturally produce good titles because I keep handing in work with like here's my like beautifully considered, like very clever title, and they're like. Yeah, well, you know, we'll get back to you about it. Like, we <laughs> so um, the first one, uh, so it ends up being, and this has been the case, I think all of my books so far, that there's like a lengthy back and forth. And I, I like to maybe make a diversion into like the culture of the publishing industry, if I may, for a moment. Yes, yeah, so that, that's one of my questions. Yes, yeah, so let's talk about that. Well, so I, you know, I don't work in publishing, right? Uh -huh. Like, writing stuff is not the same thing as working in publishing. Like you don't work in publishing either, you know? Our contact with publishing is like sort of sideways. And publishing it has an incredibly genteel culture to it. This is, and like keeping in mind that this is, you know, like Jackie Onassis like decided to work in publishing as like her second act, like after, you know, after she was, I mean, later, you know, um, it's like, it has this very Hamptons kind of vibe. Like obviously there's like, a rich variety of people who work in publishing, but that is still kind of the culture that people are stepping into. Yeah, yeah, it's a problem. Like, yeah. <laughs> people are polite, like people are very polite. And so I kept finding myself, it would take me like several days or even weeks of like super polite, nurturing, interested conversations about the title issue before I realized they have picked a title that they know <laughs> is gonna work and will be good. And they are slowly waiting for me to figure out that that is the correct title and to get on board. Funny. So I just made that process like faster and faster as the books mm -hmm. went by where I'd be like, okay, obviously like you guys are the ones who know how to market and like you're all very smart and you've all read the book. So like, just take it away. Um, on this one, I did like, this was one of the options that I had put on a short list. And the idea was yeah. that they wanted, you know, they wanted it to be kind of thematically linked to the first one. Um, but also there is a line in the book where she says she's having this kind of flirtatious conversation with um, with Max, with her love interest. And Max says, you know, all the girls at the bar talk about you, um, you know, oh, right. like it's such a mystery. And she says, like, I'm not a mystery, mm -hmm. which, you know, like, of course she is, of course she like behaves in a mysterious fashion all the time. So I liked that moment because she's like simultaneously revealing and like not revealing herself. Like, obviously, yeah. you know. Um, but also it was like a little bit of a wink because, you know, I did not actually expect this work to be sort of taken seriously as, as, um, as mystery novels. Like I, I didn't really expect that to happen. Yeah. Um, I didn't actually expect it to be on those lists and grouped in that place and in that, on that list on Amazon and all that stuff. So it was like a little bit of kind of a, a like, a, like a wink at that, you know, like it yeah. is probably literally on a mystery shelf right now, you know? So I sort of liked the yeah. idea of that being the title. That's one thing that's so cool about the crime fiction world and the mystery world is like everyone is like, it's like expansive. So like I had a similar experience with my third book. Well, really my second book was a horror book, Come Closer, and a lot of, but it had like some sort of noir elements and a lot of crime people picked up on it and supported it. And then my third book was like a straightforward crime book dope. But like you, since I had like thought of myself as more of a literary writer, I wasn't, I just didn't really even know there was this whole world of like mystery bookstores and this whole community and all the lists and everything. And it's such a cool place because everyone, like I said, it's expansive. So no one's going to be like, oh, well, if you also do other stuff, you're not included or you're, it's not really a mystery book. The readership is really like, oh, we want things that are different. We want things that are not the straight, you know, the straightforward expected thing as opposed to like oh, yeah. other genres, which have like all of this sort of gatekeepers, like, no, you're not really a part of it because you didn't do this or you didn't do that. Is it really, 
this or that. And, and the mystery world is sort of like, eh, if it has a mystery element, like I have a Paul Oster <laughs> book sitting here. And like Paul Oster has won Edgar Awards. You know, he's, in addition to all of his other awards, he has won, uh, he's considered a mystery writer. Oh, and that's I think, funny, I didn't realize that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is this like openness. I kind of did expect to like have my, have my credentials checked somehow. Expect them to be like, name, yeah. you know, like name 50 Le Carre novels or something. I'd be like, I don't know. I know, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't, well, I don't know about the spy people. Yeah, maybe the spy people are just like, you know, no, you can't get in. Yeah, I don't know about <laughs> that. They're a whole different animal. No, I'm just kidding, spy people. I just don't know that world very well. But yeah, the mystery world is this beautiful, like, everyone's welcome. It has a little bit of a mystery element. That's that's enough, you know. Yeah. Um, the readers are, are there's a, such a variety of readers, including some who are really sophisticated about genre and wanting to play with it and wanting to kind of go to different places. So that was like a really pleasant surprise for me too when I started with this stuff. Um, so one thing that's really interesting about Vera Kelly is she is a lesbian in a time when being a lesbian is not just something you would keep secret, but actually a crime in a lot of places. Um, and in New York, it certainly was. I don't know if it was on the books, but it was, you could be arrested for sure. And I've met older gay women who have told stories about and you have a bust in the um, book where the lesbian bar gets busted. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about that as it relates to the character herself and also as it relates to this world of crime and criminals and all of that. I was really intrigued by the idea that she has this secret life while she's looking at other people's secrets. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, I think it's sort of, you know, when I was writing the first book, it kind of developed, like as I was thinking through her backstory and and her important relationships and all of this, um, it made a lot of sense to me that she would be a lesbian because she sort of, she has, like, that is partly what closes off the, like, normal sort of shortcuts to security for her that, that yeah. like, most young women of her class and generation would have made. Um, and so I needed something that would kind of give somebody a little bit of a push into making more unusual choices in the in the you know in the quest to like have an independent life and and meet her own material needs and all of that stuff because choosing to join the CIA is a pretty extreme uh in, you know in covert ops is like a pretty extreme choice you know so I was like doing a lot of thinking about what what would make a person what kind of setup in a person's life would make that seem like yeah okay you know like I'll do that yeah at the same time of course you were not you know, you couldn't be openly gay in the CIA um, at that time, um, or anywhere um, in the government officially. Um, so, but that's sort of the case all over for her, um, or in you know most most fields that she might consider. So, it doesn't push her um, away from it. So, that's kind of a, something that would would sort of drive a person to make choices that like most of us might not make under those exact circumstances, like you know, that piece of it and also the relation, the kind of severing of the relationship with her family that happens because she's, yeah. she has a small family to start with and her father's died and her mom is, you know, has sort of the one who's thrown her out. So she's really on her own um, in a like really profound way. Um, and yeah, and this one, I also, you know, the idea that she, she gets fired for being gay, which was, uh, you know, federally legal until last week also. Uh, mm -hmm. That is no more. Um, <laughs> uh, so again, just a, a way of sort of like, she's like, she's on her own. She has to like find her own way to do this, which means in that case, kind of setting up shop for herself. Um, you know, and yeah, I think it has, I think probably other people could speak to this like more intelligently and in more depth, but I think there is a real um, kind of line of that running through a lot of kind of mid-century fiction. Um, this sort of like outsider idea, this idea of subcultures of kind of passing through the urban space um, through these like different worlds that are all kind of linked together, but also very separate. Um, and on a practical level, you know, like thinking in terms of noir, like a lot of um, gay bars and clubs and stuff were basically under mob protection or like had those kinds of relationships at that time. It was like, if you were a person who was gonna open up um, a bar and welcome gay people like that was something that would get you raided by the cops you might be willing to do other stuff that would get you raided by the cops too you know it wasn't um it was yeah. a, a kind of world 
Um, yeah, yeah. You were forced into this sort of demi monde or this world of being you know, legal just for doing ordinary things like going on a date or whatever. I was once talking to an older gay woman. This was like 20 years ago, and she was like in her 70s then. She's probably no longer with us. And she was talking about going to bars um, in Manhattan on Broadway and 4th Street. There's been, I haven't been there in years, but for years and years and years, there was a sort of like underground, literally underground bar there. And I guess at one point it had been a lesbian bar. And she remembered how when the cops come in, everyone had to put their hands on the table because or else the cops thought the women were like doing something with their hands under the table. So you wouldn't, there would be like some whole other level of harassment. So everyone had to like put their hands on the table. So it was clear there was no sexual activity and they were just having yeah. their drink. That place would just kind of beat people up. It was just, you know, this horrifying thing. Right. Um, so I just found out today or yesterday that you were also a therapist um, and a social worker therapist. And I thought that was really interesting. I don't think I know any other therapist novelists. Uh, <laughs> I think you're the first one. And I thought that was such an interesting combination. And it makes sense, you know, it's, they're both jobs that require a curiosity about people and an insight into people. And I was curious um, if those jobs intersect, how they intersect, what is being a therapist and being a writer? How do those relate to each other? Yeah, I think, let me just adjust my light. Yeah, I know it's getting darker and darker over there. Yeah, I see. It's darker That's on the East Coast. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I think that they're really related. I've been thinking about this a lot lately because I just, um, at the end of January, I left a, an administrative job at a, at a mental health clinic um, and went into private practice. So I've been taking, I've been doing a lot of clinical work again after kind of not doing as much of it for a little while. Um, and I love it. It's awesome. Um, and it feels, it feels very related, um, because it's, it's, a the entire medium of therapy is, is words. It's, it's all yeah. linguistic. And yeah. like, you know, I'm listening to a person, I mean, and this is like an incredible opportunity for a person who's interested in, in writing and who, who, who's interested in character and stuff. Like I, like, listen to an hour long mon monologue, more or less. I'm not, you know, some are more, more monologue than others like many times a week, you know, for like the, the way that you get to know a person is like really interesting um, in that setting. And I also, I think that the way that, um, you know, the way that I tend to try to understand what a person is telling me is a very narrative way. I mean, I find myself asking questions a lot. Like, yeah, I ask a lot of chronology questions. Like, I'm like, do you remember feeling that way before this happened? Do you remember, did that shift after X happened or do you remember how you saw yourself when you were this age like versus how you see yourself now and do you remember when that changed like all of those kinds of things um tend to be the way that i just how i process the world and the thing is that's the way everybody processes the world like people have varying levels of of um ease with like narrative convention but i think everyone understands their own life narratively yeah i think so kind of i feel like what what i'm doing with a client usually is like i'm i'm trying to help them like rework their narrative into something that is more helpful yeah. um, for what they're trying to do and be at that moment. So um, yeah, I think it has a big influence. And on the practical side, I mean, I did used to work in foster care, which is why. Um, so okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's up a lot in the books, which I think is a really interesting thing. And it sort of ties back to that history of the private eye and going into these places where other people don't go because this world of foster kids is like, such a blind spot in society and a place where people don't look. It's really interesting that she has such deep connection to that place. Um, so should we go on to our questions from the audience? Or do you have, is there anything else you want to talk about privately with me? <laughs> but is there go away. <laughs> right? It's just like a coffee date. Um, this is therapy. This is actually Zoom therapy. We were talking huh. about Zoom therapy earlier. I do my Zoom therapy in my car. I just sit in my car and talk to my therapist. I don't know how he feels about that. Um, so now that we're done with therapy, um, is there anything else before we go to where we have a couple questions here? Should I go on or? No, I think we can throw it open. Okay, let's see what our Q&As are here. Kristen Martin. Hi, Kristen Martin. Hi. Oh, whoops, I, I clicked the wrong thing. There we go. Hi. Kristen Martin said, how did you approach historical research of both the lesbian scene of 1960s New York City and the post Trujillo? Trujillo? I apologize for my bad Spanish. You speak Spanish. Um, yeah, post, yeah. post, you know, the guy, Dominican mm -hmm. Republic, and translating all of that into this new book. 
Um, um, I, so I, I read them, I read some books that were super helpful on both counts. I read um, as like a kind of shorter, like less academic and very readable book about gay women um, in the 20th century. There is, uh, I'm not going to put you through watching me try to locate it on my shelf, but <laughs> there's a book called Odd Girls and Twilight Lovers, which is yes, like a that's very, a great book. yeah, that's a great book. Um, and it kind of goes decade by decade for like how, you know, how lesbians were meeting each other, where they were hanging out, like what the sort of self-conception of, of the group was, you know, to the extent that you can generalize yeah. that, of course. Um, I also read um, Boots of Leather, Slippers of Gold, which is, um, that's like a, an oral history kind of um, sociological, that's really an academic thing, and I, uh, it's a bit denser, but it's like oral histories of this um, lesbian community in Buffalo um, from like the, the Oh, that sounds days. familiar. Yeah, I think maybe I do know that book. Yeah, what's it called again? Say the title again. I believe it's Boots of Leather, Slippers of Gold. I think okay. that's the name of that one. Um, and that has like a few co-authors. Because um, uh, that's actually one of the <laughs> most fun things about that was like the list of names of gay bars in Buffalo in oh, the 50s. Let's hear some of them. They were so wonderful. The one that I remember is Club Moon Glow with no W after the O, just Moon Glow. Yeah. That's how wonderful is that? You could never come up with that, right? That's like, yeah. Um, beautiful. And uh, yeah, they so read, um, there's one called, there's one that's called Gay New York, which you'd be like, well, that must cover it, but actually it is only about men. Yeah, there you go. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's like 1900 to 1950, but that is like the authoritative text on that, I think, for, mm -hmm. you know, for a general reader, which is what I am. Um, so yeah, there was that stuff. Uh, and then for um, the Dominican Republic, I read, uh, it's called like Commun Communists, Ragtags, and Scum, or something like that. <laughs> um, oh, here it is. Ragtags, scum, riffraff, and commies. Oh, and this me. is a photo of this is a photo of LBJ and Juan Balaguer. Are you sure the, that's not one of the queer history books? Because I'm looking at the cover. And those guys look right? very close. I don't. It's a little blurry, so I don't know who they are, and I'm ignorant, so I wouldn't know anyway. I think you got your shelves mixed up, and those guys okay. are about to kiss. This is this is LBJ, and this is uh, Balaguer, who was the you know tyrant who was in charge of the DR um, after the American invasion. And this is how cozy this is you know I think chosen to be representative for how cozy the relationship yeah. was yeah. between the United States um, and and his regime. Um, you know, when I did some you know what I the first time that I got a New York Times subscription was when I was doing the research for the first book because if you pay oh, for the so subscription, good. yeah, you get the complete archives, which like. Yes. I know the New York Times is super frustrating, but it's like an incredible resource. Like you would just not believe the stuff you can get out of the archives for just the regular subscription fee. It's crazy. Yeah, it's amazing. You got to take it all with a grain of salt, but just to have that as your starting point for everything for the, you know, 10 bucks a month or whatever it is, is really, really totally. something. I mean, I'm old enough to remember going to the library and the microfiche and, you know, it's very easy to romanticize right. all that analog technology now, but the microfiche actually was a challenge. The microfilm and the microfiche were not easy <laughs> to deal with. Those were not, we should not miss those. I like vinyl, yeah. sure, but we don't miss microfiche at all. It's really better <laughs> to just look on the archive. So our next question is from Thomas Cook. Thomas, I think I know you. Your name is very familiar. Do we know a Thomas Cook? I think I might know you, Thomas Cook. I know. Um, Thomas. Is he another writer? Is he a writer? The name yeah, is really he's, a writer. he's a great writer. He's also in my writing group. Um, cool. So, yeah, I think we all know you, Thomas. So I will read your question. Hi, um, Thomas. Thomas says, before the shutdown, there was a movie called Portrait of a Lady on Fire, which dealt with a woman painter and one of, in the 1700s. And one of the things that struck me was when she explained that as a woman, Thomas, I'm abbreviating a bit, I apologize. She wasn't allowed to study the male form and she could not depict the great events because they were masculine. But your books, you, Rosalie, your books seem to deal almost unconsciously with men looking at women and women looking at men. That's really interesting. What I'm wondering, how was Vera affected by this? 
in the first pages you read, she seems to understand and also not care about it. I'm not reading your last line because you don't need to apologize, Thomas. That was a good question. No apologies <laughs> needed. Really that was good and it was the perfect length. It was not too long at all. This so is what think Tom does in workshop. He, he like is quiet for 45 minutes and then he suddenly hits you with something like that. And it's, a good, um, and it's a good question. Yeah, it's really interesting. There is a lot of her looking at women and women looking at her and her looking at men. There is a lot of looking, and actually, when we were going through copy edits, they were they were like marking up all the times I said looked and looking in the text, and I was like, I don't know how to work around that. I've got yeah, very limited synonyms fine. for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and it's it, that's interesting that you say that about that section because right there is the like she's because it's a situation where this this guy is trying to catch her out and like shame her, and he succeeds. I mean, he he succeeds in taking away her job, but she kind of refuses to, she refuses to be embarrassed in the moment, you know what I mean? Like, I think, I think you're referring to the moment when she just says she, she like stares back at him until- Oh yeah, that's like, an interesting I to win that staring contest, you know what I mean? Like, I kind of wanted her to have that. Um, but yeah, I think there's a way, like she's of course an observer, so she's, she's, she's watching people all the time. Um, and I think in that way, like, is a little bit sort of slippery under the male gaze comparatively, like she sort of, she she does she doesn't really care as much about how she's evaluated by men, obviously because she's gay, um, but also because like she is watching and forming judgments all the time. I think she generally feels less um, kind of persecuted and affected by other people's looking at her. Maybe yeah, she's more of a subject and less of an object. I think yeah yeah I would I would like to think that anyway yeah yeah thank you Tom um, and here's one more question anonymous attendee. Reveal yourself, anonymous attendee. <laughs> we're not, we're, we weren't private eye novels. We will find out who you are, anonymous, so-called anonymous attendee. We're getting to the bottom of this. Anyway, I'm just starting the first Vera Kelly. So my question is way, way, way more general. That's fine, anonymous. I'm curious if you feel that writing fiction, and I imagine consuming a great deal, has brought you closer to what you suspect is reality or farther away. I don't know if they mean in general or about private eye. I'd also say, especially in that detective fiction is a way of parsing, exploring, making sense of the world. That is a really cool question. That is a really, really cool question. Yes. Anonymous, you should reveal yourself and take credit for your good question. Um, I think, I mean, that's, wow. I'm still pondering. I think yeah. uh, it does for me because I think, um, to me, it's like that. That's that's what I that's what I do with with stuff. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like I'm, my life hands me stuff. Or like my day to day existence hands me stuff, and like that's the thing that I do with it. And so that sort of, even though I don't I don't write autobiographically, and that's that's not what I mean. But in yeah. the same way that like your sub your unconscious like the way it does with the stuff that happens during the day is that it like turns it into these sort of bizarre and opaque dreams, but that's still processing. Um, and I'm not sure this is exactly what you meant when you asked me, but I get to do whatever I want with the response to the question. So, uh, yeah. to, to me, I do it because I'm, I'm trying to understand uh, reality. And I think the fact that language is not reality, that it's merely reality adjacent, is yeah. like makes it so that writing is sort of this this like you're like constantly aware of the gap between even the very very best thing that you can do and the actual reality which sort of makes you attuned all the time to what you perceive right. that reality and that's to be. the lack right that space in between language and reality yeah exactly yeah like that frustration is kind of what the whole project is about i think i mean the project of like writing things <laughs> you know i think so um, I have a theory that one reason why writers become writers and why you keep writers is you were trying to bridge your perception of reality and other people's perception of reality. And I think there's a literalness to it, but I also think anonymous, whoever you may be, you, you know, if you meant more, I know this was for her, not for me, but I'm answering anyway, because I'm interested in it. <laughs> I think that it's, um, it is, you get closer to a metaphorical reality, you know, because if you were writing honestly and truly, you were really digging into questions and so even though you might be saying nothing that is literally true, you are spiritually, for lack of a better word, 
getting much closer to the truth to people who choose not to think about those things or not to write those things. And again, I think that is part of why we write is to bridge these gaps in reality, whether it's between language and truth with more language or whether it's between your reality and other people's reality or whether it's a distance between your soul and someone else's soul, we write to like fill these holes in reality and to bridge it all. So um, that's my unsolicited yeah. response, Anonymous. <laughs> I will co-sign on that. Yes, good. And I think that is it. It's, does anyone have like another super quick question? I think we are done. There's one new message here, but I don't think this is a great event. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. And so I think now we turn it back over to Chelsea. I think we are okay. I managed to do that without asking for help. <laughs> Let's have a round of applause for me that I know how to use Zoom. Thank you so much, but I'll turn over your tables. <laughs> Um, thank, uh, thank you so much, Rosalie and Sarah, for this great conversation. Yeah. And thank you to everyone who virtually joined us tonight and came out for this. Uh, a reminder that you can get Rosalie's book, Vera Kelly is Not a Mystery, through greenlightbookstore.com. And if you buy within the next week, you can get 15% off with code MYSTERY. Um, and tonight's event has been recorded, so you have to miss any part of it for any reason, or if you had friends or family who really wanted to catch it but missed it, uh, keep an eye out on Greenlight's website and on our YouTube channel for that recording. Thank you so much again, everyone, for spending a wonderful evening with us, and have a great rest of your evening. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Rosalie, and thank you, Chelsea. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sarah and Chelsea. Thank you ever for coming. I'm looking at your names and I'm, thank you. Love you. <laughs>